Good afternoon. This is another day that the Lord has made. We're so pleased uh, to be here in the state of Georgia. And I want to thank Shauna Williams for her introduction. I'm going to be moderating a panel while we are engaging in lunch. But I want to say a word about Benjamin S. Ruffin. I'm from North Carolina. I'm from Oxford, North Carolina. Ben Ruffin was from Durham, North Carolina. Durham was the city. I'm from the country. And, but we grew up together as civil rights fighters, civil rights activists. And Ben Ruffin rose to the top of the corporate ladder, particularly in Reynolds. And he was one of the founding members of the Corporate Roundtable. Uh, many of you who knew Ben Ruffin when he was alive, uh, this brother not only spoke truth to power, but he put resources to back up speaking truth to power. And so we are very honored to have this Corporate Roundtable luncheon in his name. And we certainly thank Reynolds for being the corporate sponsor. I got to recognize protocol. Uh, I'm so glad to be in the state of Georgia. I'm, we have so many African American elected officials in Georgia at the state level. And I want to bring up the president of the National Black Caucus of State Legislation, Representative Billy Mitchell. Come on up, Billy. I just happened to be in the neighborhood, heard there was some free food, <laughs> thought I'd stop by. You know, very seriously, I just wish uh, my grandmother was still alive to, to see this. Uh, she, you know, to be introduced by Ben Chavis, certainly a lieutenant of Martin Luther King Jr., the president of the National Newspaper Association, whose advocacy has certainly changed not only the communities that he served in, but this world indeed. You ought to give Ben Chavis a hand. And if she can see, my grandmother could see me among you, she would have thought that I grew up to make something of myself, which was many a day in doubt. Uh, but I, I do want to say that it has been a pleasure working with your chair, uh, Patrick Hanna. He has done an extraordinary job. Uh, I, I'm just amazed that he could keep up his professionalism on his job and the dedication that he put into this organization uh, was inspiring. And I just want to recognize you publicly, uh, Mr. Chairman, would you please stand and let them properly recognize you again. Kristen Gibbons is an extraordinary person, and I'm, I'm anxious to see if you will be able to fill the shoes of Patrick Hanna. This is an extraordinary partnership that we have, the National Black Caucus of State Leg Legislators with our corporate roundtable. We could not do what we do without the corporate roundtable uh, 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 support. And certainly for our, our sponsor here for today, Reynolds, I certainly appreciate all that you do. It's a commitment of mine that what I want to take this organization is we want to see where we are now, see where we ought to be, and find ways to close that gap. One of the ways that I wish to do that is uh, we have a uh, a lobbying community that uh, represents African Americans who have far too few opportunities, but they have great, legi great legislative relationships which could make a difference not only in the communities that we serve, but for the corporations here uh, that we have. And so we want to close that gap. We have a lot of students who are not exposed to the wherewithal of corporations and what they do. I'm, I will tell you that our students don't have this predilection to be athletes and entertainers. They be what they see. I want them to be able to see the inner workings of corporate America, and I want to, us to be able to close that gap. We have so many other opportunities to be able to do to do good. And if we can take our partnerships in here to close those gaps, we will all look back one day and say we are better for it. We are better 
we are as good as we can possibly be, to borrow a, a slogan from Martin Luther King, I can't be all that I can be unless you are all that you can be. And certainly we are great, not despite our diversity, but because of it. And I'm so glad to be partnering with you, the Corporate Roundtable of NBCSL. Thank you so very much. Very good. I know we've already started to eat, and you know we want to make sure that we say our grace. So I want to call upon uh, State Representative, uh, State Senator Lowe. Come on up from North Carolina. Give us the grace, man. Um, I was told to say something. I had talked to April Ruffin on yesterday afternoon because she, she is my campaign treasurer. And I told her I would be at this event. And her father often talked about it. And we played golf together. And I have to tell one Ben Ruffin story. Me and Ben were playing golf. And we were playing for more than bragging rights. And while we were playing, he's going to direct me on a putt that I didn't make and I didn't pay. Somebody will get that. <laughs> but that's my Ben Ruffin story. Very, very dear friend for many, many years up until the time of his death. And you never know in life where you will be. And I'm certainly glad he planted some trees that many of us are able to enjoy. Let us pray. Our God, our Father, we thank thee and we love thee as the creator of all good and beautiful gifts. We thank thee for this time of fellowship, this time of learning, this time of growth, and the opportunity to serve. Now we ask that you'd continue to be with us. These things we pray. Thank you. And all of the people said. Thank you, Senator Lowe. I recognize in the audience we're going to go on the program. We were a little late starting. But I do have to recognize, first, one of our major national leaders of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Honorable Mark Mariel of the National Urban League. We're glad to welcome him here. And listen, we all know what happened in 2020, and we know what's going to happen in 2021. If it wasn't for black women coming out to vote, a lot of us wouldn't be in the offices that we have now. Right. And I want you to recognize our sister from the National Conference of, of Black Civic Participation, my sister, Sister Campbell. Thank you so much. Now, we're gonna have a panel discussion while you eat. Enjoy your lunch, but this is a very serious, um, issue, the need for racial equity impact assessments, unintended consequences of legislative ban and prohibi prohibition proposals. The murder of George Floyd glaringly eliminated, and, and glaringly illuminated actually, persistent and pervasive inequities and injustices in American society, and focused the nation on the long overdue need for police and policing reform to improve police and black community relations. Conscientious policymakers are zealous in their efforts to do whatever it takes to improve safety, quality of life, and health in black and Hispanic communities, even if it means making selected products unavailable by imposing bans and prohibitions. Some of you know, in my career in the civil rights movement, I'm always want to detect things that amount to racial profiling, amount to racial inequities, and we need to do everything we can in a public policy perspective to protect our community. And those of us who engage in making public policy, we have to always ask, what is the racial consequence of this particular policy? 
what is the racial consequence of this regulation. And I'm very pleased to be joined uh, on the panel today. I'm going to introduce them one by one. Distinguished black law enforcement executives from the black and Latino community, and also one of our past presidents of the National Medical Association, distinguished medical authority on this subject. I've always said, from the civil rights perspective, I see Brother Albert Turner there, it's better to be escorted by the police than chased by the police. So I'm glad to be in the presence of these colleagues that I'm getting ready to uh, introduce. First, I would like to bring up to the panel the deputy chief, uh, he's retired deputy chief of the Rochester Police Department. Uh, he's a longtime member of Noble and other law enforcement organizations. He's an expert on what we're going to be discussing uh, today. So welcome Deputy Chief Wayne Harris. Wayne Harris. Next, I would like to uh, bring up former Deputy Inspector for the New York City Police Department, uh, Corey Pegas. I've known Corey for many, many years. Uh, don't dress, judge him by the way he's dressed. This brother is, <laughs> is on it. He's a police uh, executive, um, an authority in this subject matter, and we're pleased that Corey took time out of his schedule to join us on this schedule. <laughs> now, for New York, I know there are a lot of New Yorkers in the house. <laughs> uh, an active law enforcement, he wanted me to tell you, he's not retired, he's active. This brother works with the North, uh, New York State Black State Troopers. He's of the Guardians Association. Uh, please welcome Officer Elliot T. Boyce. <laughs> Next is representing uh, the New York City Police Department, also uh, the national chairperson of National Latino Officers Association, Chief Anthony Miranda. Let's welcome Chief. And last but not least, one of the past presidents of the National Medical Association, so proud of our black doctors. Let's give our black doctors a hand who've been on the front line of this COVID uh, pandemic, keeping us safe. And he's written an award-winning book, uh, Dr. Ron, uh, Dr. Ron K. Belly. Dr. Belly uh, is an authority, uh, not only in medicine, but in psychiatry, and he's pleased to join this discussion. Let's welcome Dr. Belly. All right. So I guess this is mic on, good. Please continue your meals, but this is a great subject matter. I'm going to ask Chief Harris to lead off, because I think we have a slide presentation so we can get into the subject matter. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. We're going to try our best to keep your attention while you're eating, but thank you all for being here. So as Dr. Chavis said, we're going to have a conversation about the unintended consequences of legislation. And I'm going to qualify this by saying none of us up here are cigarette smokers. This is not a conversation trying to get anyone to run out and buy a pack of Newports or a pack of Marlboro. This is us as police officers here today to talk to you about how bad policy not only impacts our industry, but also impacts our communities. Can we start the PowerPoint, please? So we chose this picture intentionally because I want to set the tone. I want us to keep in mind not only the murder of this this man on the streets of Minneapolis, but the unrest that occurred afterwards. I want to talk to you about how policing intersects with the community and how the decisions that we make as legislators, 
as citizens impact how we end up dealing with people on the streets. So prior to beginning, some of the slides that I'm going to show you, I'm going to try and move through these as quickly as we can because I want us to be able to have some dialogue. I want us to be able to have some conversation. But some of the slides that I'm going to show you here are based on some of the people that support the prohibition of mentholated tobacco products. And that's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to use as our vehicle for our discussion. And I'm going to change a little bit for my partners up here that are going to call it a ban, and I'm going to use the word prohibition. Because it speaks to the fact that we as a society have tried prohibition on a number of occasions, and it's never worked. It didn't work in the 1920s with alcohol, and it's not working today. So one of the things they're going to tell you is that mentholated products cause young people to smoke. And unfortunately, in this statistic here that you'll see, this is from 2019. It dates back to 2000. And what it shows is that only about 3.7% of youth are actually engaged in any sort of tobacco smoking at all. And even fewer use menthol at about 1.7%. What they are smoking is marijuana. And as we're talking about, I heard somebody laugh, and that's OK. Especially my people from New York back in there, and I, I heard them. <laughs> Thank you. And I bring that up because New York State just passed legislation that says it's OK to smoke marijuana. So if we're in a community right now that it's OK to smoke marijuana, and we're talking about mentholated tobacco products and saying you can't smoke that, something that's been legal for over a century, there's a problem. I put this slide up here. We put this slide up here because in 2013, the FDA came out with this quote, basically saying that menthol cigarettes are not associated with an increase in disease risk. I put this here because it suggests that this conversation, at least those that are in support of the prohibition of mentholated tobacco products, are doing so for political reasons. Because just recently, as of 2021, the FDA has reversed their position. And now they're saying the menthol is a product. It's a problem. One of the things they're saying is menthol smokers do not have more difficulty ceasing smoking. That is not true. If you take a look at the slide, African American menthol smokers were not significantly different from non menthol smokers in successful cessation. Another report said we found no difference in success at smoking cessation with or without menthol. And that also that the data indicates that mentholated cigarette smokers do not exhibit greater signs of nicotine dependence. Nicotine is what addicts people to cigarettes. It's not menthol. And the people that support this prohibition will tell you that the menthol in a tobacco product soothes the throat as it goes down. That may or may not be true. But it does not make it any harder to quit nor does it make it any more addictive. One of the things they mention frequently is that the tobacco industry has priced mentholated tobacco products at a lower level to entice people of color to smoke cigarettes. As you see on this graph, and this goes back for a five year period of time, there was no significant difference in the pricing of cigarettes. They cost what they cost. Part of the reason we're up here is to talk about the illegal trade, the illicit sales of cigarette products. This is not just speculation. Anyone from Illinois here? Anyone from Chicago here? Chicago, do you or do you not have a gang unit within your police department that is dealing solely on illicit cigarette sales? Yes, you do. Because our gangs have figured out that it's less problematic to sell cigarettes on the streets than it is to sell narcotics on the streets. And why is that a problem for law enforcement? 
That's exactly why they killed Eric Garner. And we'll get to Eric Garner in a second. But think about Mrs. Harris who's sitting in her home, a prisoner. She can't go outside because the gangs are outside selling illegal cigarettes. They're not selling drugs anymore, but they're using that same bit of violence to protect their turf. That's what we're talking about. There's an increased expenditure of law enforcement resources. It's going to drain us, and we're already understaffed. Increased negative law enforcement interactions with communities of color. We see that happening. Increased youth access to cigarettes. Increased consumption of unregulated cigarettes. And significantly reduced excise and sales tax revenue. We'll talk about that in a minute. These cigarettes that you see up on the side, those are homemade. Right now, the tobacco that's being sold on the streets and stores and in bodegas are regulated by the tobacco industry. They have to. That's why you don't see the Newport Jazz Festival anymore. That's why you don't see billboards up promoting cigarettes. The tobacco industry has taken steps to make sure this is being done properly. But if we deregulate this, then JoJo's going to be in the basement dropping something into a cigarette and selling it on the street, swearing it's menthol. That's a problem. Over half of the cigarettes sold in the state of New York are illegal, 50%. The state of Texas just intercepted 422 million illegal cigarette brands. It's happening. This is not theoretical. It's happening every single day. We're going to talk a little bit about the Native American reservations and the untaxed cigarettes that they sell there that people can go, purchase, and come back to the streets and sell. State of Massachusetts tried a prohibition. It did not work. People went to Connecticut, they went to Rhode Island, they went to New York, they went everywhere else but Massachusetts to get their mentholated products. Because one, it did not cause them to stop smoking mentholated products, and two, Massachusetts lost a whole lot of millions of dollars just on sale of revenue, or the lost revenue. So much so that now, two years later, they're trying to reverse that bit of legislation. San Francisco tried the same thing. They didn't go to another state in California. They just simply went to another county. And it was the same result. Not long ago, the American Lung Association polled a number of African Americans, actually polled everyone, but a whole lot of African Americans, and almost 100% said that such a prohibition will only serve to add harassment to people of color. In other words, it will put another tool in the tool belt of police officers to go out there and approach an individual standing on the corner, walking up and down the sidewalk, doing something that's been legal for over a century. This is why we're up here. This was in California. This is a 14-year-old boy who was smoking, uh, rolling up a cigar. It wasn't even marijuana. The boy weighed maybe 100 pounds. But this police officer approached him, and that young 14-year-old boy does what a whole lot of 14-year-old boys do. He told him to go pound a rock. And that police officer thought it was appropriate to body slam this 14-year-old boy down on the ground and pin his head to the floor. This is not theoretical. Ocean City, Maryland. These young men on the top were vaping. Four or five police officers approached them because it was illegal to vape. And on a conversation that should have been, yo man, you got to go, this turned into all of them being body slammed down on the ground and physically arrested. Dr. Chavis mentioned the racial equity assessment impact assessment. I'm not up here to ask you anything. I'm up here to educate. But I can tell you, were I a legislator, I would want to take a look at how the legislation that I was proposing was going to impact my communities. And someone mentioned Eric Gardner. This man was alleged to be selling loose cigarettes. A violation at best. 
certainly not something where deadly physical force was necessary to use, and yet we all watched this man lay on the sidewalk, repeating over and over again, I can't breathe. And now he's dead. I'm going to finish with this. If we're going to ban this, ban it all. If you're going to ban any kind of tobacco product, ban everything. Not just something that is going to impact the black and brown community, where of those that do smoke, 85 to 90 percent of them prefer menthol products. Ban pipes. Ban cigars. I heard people laughing over here because they know they ain't giving up their cigars. And quite honestly, I ain't gonna give up my cigar every once in a while either, but. So thank you for your time. That's our slide presentation. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues and I hope we have some good robust conversation, even from our most <clears throat> staunch critics. And I know she's over here and I'm looking right at her because I can't wait to have this conversation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Deputy Chief Harris. I know it's hard to give a presentation like this. Let's give his brother a hand for the presentation. <clears throat> we need the data. We need the data. We need the research. And of course, it's better to ask these questions before the legislation is passed rather than after the legislation is passed. Uh, Corey, I'm going to pass to you. In your distinguished career as a New York City police, officer and an executive and a commander of the force. How do you see the impact of a menthol ban, uh, not only in New York City, New York State? Yes, thanks for having me again. So I got to stand up. I want you to fully understand. I want you to think about these three people that we all know a menthol cigarette had an involvement. Sandra Bland refused to put out her new port and allegedly hung herself two days later in Texas. We just saw Eric Garner, which I'm a very good friend of his family. He was allegedly selling Lucy's. And we also saw, more importantly, George Floyd. So those are three cases that we know of. So I've been a cop for 21 years in the New York City Police Department. So I do know when the cameras are not rolling that these cops go in the back room and make up stories. So we know about those three cases, how, how many cases that we don't know about. And the main issue is we don't want any more contact between the police and the, and the minority community. With the entire country, all of you legislators here talking about defund police, restructure police, however you want to do the police, stop it. Why would you have a ban that's going to increase more and more engagement? I know this is a little confusing to you guys and ladies because the FDA is saying the ban is going to be against the manufacturer, right? So it's not going to trickle down to the police. But we know with over 150 years of experience in law enforcement sitting here, and some of my colleagues are, are sitting down there, maybe 200 years, we know in black and brown communities, the police hunt. And in non-minority communities, they protect and serve. I'm telling you, I'm an expert on that. I worked in white communities where they could do whatever they want. And in black, black communities, there was no tolerance. They had to go to jail. So we want to lessen that. And all cops not bad. I don't want to sit here and say I retired and now I hate the police. I don't, I don't hate the police, but I hate bad police and I hate bad policy. And if this FDA ban goes through, and I'm telling you it's coming your way, you're not going to know about it. They're going to slide it in. And that's what the FDA did. And I'm going to sum it up. I'm going to end it right here so that you know where this started from. You remember a few years ago we was having issues with the vaping and the kids was dying from the vaping? And so it was a good idea to ban these vape products. And then, this was under the last administration, they slid in the menthol. So they slid it in and thought that nobody was going to see it. But somebody saw it. And I have black and brown babies. And I don't want them having any contact with the police. That's unnecessary. We all got to tell them, 10 and 2 on the steering wheel, left hand out of the, out of the window, turn on the dome light. We don't want them doing that for a cigarette, all right? So I look forward to this discussion today. Thank you, Corey. All these perspectives that have been shared 
I'm from the experienced uh, brothers uh, on the force and in our community. Next, uh, State Trooper Elliot Boss, give us your perspective. You are active, you're still active duty uh, in the New York State Police Force. Yeah. Tell us about the impact, the unintended consequences of a mental ban. Well, thank you for having me. It's actually been a pleasure and an honor to interact with many of you in the room. Um, and as I spend time talking to you, what I realize is sometimes that the passion for protecting young adults and children, we lose focus on what might happen down the line. And if you can have a vision of this, um, the president mentioned back in, in an early on in this conference that the 44th president, he had opportunity to spend time with as he came to this conference. And we are walking around nowadays, and some of us, and we've had the pleasure to meet some people who basically say, I hate the police. If you think about that concept and we don't start bringing police into the police force, what's gonna happen is all the security details that I've seen come so far have had all white security officers. So for you as legislators, possibly mayors and people to move forward, what I'm telling you is if we keep the message of anti-police and we don't like the police, your security detail will never look like one of us up here. And how that parallels to this conversation is our young adults that will be out on the street that may fall prey to believing that selling illegal cigarettes are important or beneficial will run into those police officers that don't have a tolerance for them not saying yes ma'am, no sir. For them basically now, the new language is not yes ma'am, no sir, the new language is why, how come? And police officers are eight personalities. They don't take that. And I'm a police officer, proud police officer, and like Corey said, all bad police officers could go. But if you do this menthol ban, if it passes and you put your name on it, I assure you there's gonna be just like Chicago, there will be cigarette task force. I've worked undercover all throughout New York State. I've worked on gun task force. I work now in an employee assistance program. Police officers have problems too. I assure you, if this ban goes through, one, on the federal level, or particularly on the state level, when you do it on the state level, what's gonna happen is it can't be enforced because there's no entity for law enforcement officers to in fact enforce the law on a menthol ban. So that means we have to create ways in order to enforce this. So what it's gonna look like, it won't look like you was arrested for having Newport. You was, wasn't arrested for Marlboro. It'll be other offenses, the ones we know. Disorderly conduct, obstructing administration, misdemeanor crimes, and then you always get the bonus. Resisting arrest, all right? And now we enter into the system. Be careful on the policies. Make sure you forecast what will happen in the future. As a police officer who's basically born black, go die black. I assure you, when you walk into your legislative sessions and you look around and you're the only legislator of color in the room, or the only female, me in the field of law enforcement, I haven't been to a meeting in six months that had more than two black officers in it. Same situation as you. Do not let this go by, it's gonna be dangerous because there's gonna be no help in the streets because we don't have black and Latino officers coming through the door. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we appreciate the candor. We appreciate the facts. We appreciate your experience. And now I'm gonna call on uh, Chief uh, Anthony uh, Miranda, uh, representing the National Hispanic Police Association. I've known Chief for many, many years. Uh, he's an authentic brother. And not only do African Americans prefer to smoke, uh, those who smoke uh, menthol, they also, Latinos prefer to smoke. Uh, it's a cultural thing. And for somebody to develop a public policy that you know is gonna affect people of color more than anybody else, you have to ask why. Why, why, why will we even allow somebody to, to uh, purport that this is good policy when it's gonna have a devastating impact on our community? Chief Anthony Miranda. Yeah, I'm gonna stand up also and I'm gonna say, uh, Doctor, <coughs> it's a pleasure. I, I worked with the doctor and we were, we were repealing the Rockefeller drug laws. We all remember that time, right? And how long it took us to get to that point. Right. We are now going down, down that road all over again. We think about who's in the jails most of the time in the police custody, it's our community. So the struggle that we're having for African American and Latino communities are the same exact struggle, but we're still talking down two different roads on the same issue. So part of the issue is to make sure that we're all talking together so we can get there together, right? So if we're the people who are being more arrested and more incarcerated, more detained by police, why would we create another situation 
where police would have that increased contact. And then you see the size, so we're going to hammer the point home. Because when you get start having police officers determine whether a cigarette's mentholated or non-mentholated, whether it's legal or illegal, we already know what that turns into, right? That turns into a detention, an arrest, a summons somewhere down the line, and somebody doesn't pay a fine, and then it becomes a warrant, and then it becomes more people. So while we are taking many things off the table to decrease the opportunity to jail our communities, they're putting something back on in the back way to make sure that our communities become victims all over again. It's a serious issue. We don't want anybody smoking. We definitely don't want our kids smoking, right? So we start from the same point. We all want the safety of our children, most important. But we also don't want to create the situation where in that heat, in that, in that push to make sure that they're safe, that we're creating another, another issue for them, right? Cigarettes cannot be the next issue for our community. A hundred years legal product, and all of a sudden they want to take it away from people. What's the challenge that we're going to face? And again, we're not talking, you're talking about adults as well. Adults are going to be making decisions now. So you're 30, 40 years old, 50 years old, and you're, groups, you're used to smoking those cigarettes. Where are you going to get your cigarettes now? Then you're going to have mom and pop going out to the street corner trying to buy cigarettes from the guy in the corner. Can we imagine that that's going to be what we face? And I turn, I'm going to end with this. We talk about quality life calls for law enforcement. A selling a cigarette is, does it, looks just like selling a drug, right? When they start selling on the stoops, in the parks, in the back of trucks or the back of cars, the community is going to call the police. They're not going to say they're selling illegal cigarettes. They're going to say there's an illegal activity going on. It's going to be cigarettes. And that's going to be that train going down all over again, where they're going to start arresting them. That's the confrontation that happens in our street. We're talking about making sure that this does not become a quality life fight in our communities, that we don't abandon our streets all over again to have this start. We can't afford it. So again, we're urging all of you here. We've had a lot of good conversations, and we understand how our hearts are all in the same place about protecting our children. But we do not need to endanger future generations, not only of our youth, but of our adults as well. So we look forward to continuing this conversation, which was an important conversation to have. Outside of here, I know you'll ask more questions, and we're available to all of you all the time. I want to end with this, the, the scans on your tables. Please scan that code. Answer those questions for us. It's important for us to document the information. I know you talked about a lot during this conference about documentation. That's the documentation that we need, so we look forward to it, OK? Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And now, last but not least, is distinguished past president of the National Medical Association, Dr. Ryan K. Bailey. Thank you very much. I think I'll start up as well. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak for the group. I have spoken to this group uh, earlier. We used to have these events, uh, I think, in Indiana. And uh, I've, I've, I've often thought that I've uh, gained as much as, uh, as we've shared. Uh, our attempt to really work together as physicians through the National Medical Association, I think in um, your group and, and health policy concerns are essential, I think, to really manifest, I think, a decent foundation and backbone, I think, for our entire community. Uh, my comments really are, are, are in brief three key issues uh, that I think address a uh, health care initiative. I think all of my colleagues today have got to discuss issues from a law enforcement perspective, and I certainly appreciate all those items. But the three health issues I think that are in play are the issue of stigma, I think the issue of addiction, and the issue of health inequities or health disparities. In stigma, uh, as a psychiatrist by training, to my entire career addressing issues regarding stigma in the mental health arena. Uh, mistreatment of persons based on which illness we have, uh, underfunding by the NIH, uh, I think a greater degree, I think, of a uh, lack of access of health care, hospitals and access to medications for persons who have brain-related illnesses as compared to more medically-based illnesses, hypertension and diabetes and asthma and cancer, things of that nature. But the reality is we actually see the same issues regarding stigma uh, in this concern. Uh, all too often because of person's uh, race or ethnicity or background, as compared to issues regarding having a mental health type problem, the laws we have, uh, how they actually are executed or, or enacted, and I think really the overall general construct of how society interfaces with people, there often may be much more um, uh, out of balance and partisan if your concerns are psychiatric other than otherwise. I think that's in many regards what we tend to see, I think, here in this overall discussion. So we can't get past the idea that because of stigma against her, but based on somebody's race or ethnicity, that these issues or these laws that come into play may disproportionately adversely affect, I think, our community. The second issue, I think, is the issue of health care concerns regarding the use of toxic substances. The idea of the term addiction, which you know, very often uh, we use in medicine, we describe terms regarding dependence, I think, and tolerance, uh, I think is a manifest. The reality is these are health care concerns, and simply you're going to need health care regarding uh, related uh, interventions or strategies to address them. 
trying to address healthcare concerns with legal or, or responses is unlikely to work. And we, as we see very often, disproportionately, more likely to lead to more adversity in certain communities. I think someone may, may have mentioned this issue regarding uh, just say no policies that historically many in society may have thought were going to address a health concern. What we really saw disproportionately were an explosion, I think, of the number of individuals in jails and prisons, which very often I think is a uh, health initiative uh, item. But I also think disproportionately has affected persons who then lose many other aspects of life, the ability to vote and work a job and live independently and, you know, and, and marry and grow, I think, in our, in our community. So the concept of addiction cannot be overly criminalized without having an adverse impact in general. And it's important that's the case if we do it uh, adverse against those who are marginalized in our society, very often young blacks and browns without the many of the resources I think of our society to respond to, I think, the legal construct. And the final point was the issue of health inequity, health disparities. I will put in a plug for the National Medical Association. I thank you for your, your, your comment. You know, we, uh, I, I wrote a give a lecture without commenting that I got interested in this, been a 30-year doctor, but it was really 1965, 50 years ago, when the NMA, uh, the 50,000 practicing black doctors in our country really were the only medical organization then, as well as now, to support you know, issues regarding what's best for the health of all of Americans, especially those who are marginalized. Then the issue was Medicare. Many still don't realize that only black doctors supported Medicare, which was many regards, I think, an advocacy issue, I think, for our society, as to what groups generally support, which are trade issues. How do doctors get paid, or you know, where are monies for research, things of that nature. So I think that our heart has been in the right place, not only for the 50 years since Medicare legislation, or even the uh, decades since the ACA, the Obamacare legislation, where I think the entirety of the 100-year uh, construct of, of, of how we function. So we've regularly fought issues regarding health disparities and health inequities, and I think this is a classic one. This, I think, is the fight of our day, because increasingly black doctors don't stand tall and speak out against what are laws that may up front look like they have a health care orientation, but really disproportionately have an adverse policy base uh, concern uh, in the legal arena. I think we missed the opportunity to, I think, address issues that are remarkably important for our community and essential, I think, for our society. Most importantly, I think, for young black and brown men uh, who have the opportunity, who should have the opportunity to live, I think, fair and aggressive and safe lives. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Let's give all the panel a hand. They've really given us some great details. I know we're pushing the time clock. I think they're supposed to have some question and answers from the floor. Um, is there a floor mic? Anyone have a question, quick, for we, while we are getting the mic set up? Uh, Chief Harris, give us an example of how, some practical examples of how you know that these issues of racial profiling, racial targeting in law enforcement don't work. Certainly, so when we've done this, and we've, we've given this presentation around the country a number of times, and I'm coming from Rochester, New York, and for those of you that don't know, Rochester, city of about 200,000, heavily impacted by poverty, and the relationship between the police department and the community is not good. My last assignment on the police department was the Deputy Chief of Community Engagement and Relations. Because of some issues that occurred in the city of Rochester, our mayor sent me out there to come back with some specifics as to what was wrong. Part of my job was to have conversation. And when I spoke to the community and I asked them how they were feeling, they were very clear. They did not trust us. And then I would say, well, can you give me a reason why? And they would say, sure. Do you remember a couple years ago when y'all tried that thing called Project Cool Down? Now then, as in today, the violence in the city of Rochester was out of control. City of 200,000 this year, so far we've had 77 homicides. Project Cool Down was our strategy to address that violence. And we use something like the vehicle and traffic law. But not in terms of, oh, you ran a red light, or you failed to signal a turn. We use something as simple and mundane as not having a bell on a bicycle. Now, how many of y'all in here, by a show of hands, have a bell on your bicycle right now? I didn't think so. I haven't had one on my bike since I was a boy. But we were choosing to stop young men and women of color in the hottest communities, the hottest violent hit communities for not having a bell on their bicycle. And what we're talking about is law enforcement using strategies like that 
to further an investigation. That's how this starts. That's why we're talking about a prohibition on a menthol tobacco product. Because if I'm out there smoking on the corner, that gives license for a police officer to walk up and say, oh, yo, yo, man, what kind of cigarette is that? That's menthol, where'd you get it? And so the ball begins to roll. Just as it was when we were out there stopping young men and women of color while they were riding their bicycles up and down the streets of Rochester for not having a bell. Is it against the law? It's a violation? Yes. But is it something we ought to be using to stop these young men, when, I'm sorry, young men and women of color? No. Because fast forward now to 2021, what happens when a police officer steps to a young man or woman of color on our streets? We all know what happens. That's what we're talking about. That's how we've chosen to racially profile individuals for doing mundane things in order to further an investigation, which unfortunately, far too often, has led to tragedy. Thank you, Chief. I know that um, I want to bring up Chairman Hanna uh, because there's a very important um, subject matter that needs to be done by the association. So let's welcome our chairman, Chairman Hanna. Okay. Let's give this panel another round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, very helpful information. Knowledge is power, so we appreciate you sharing with us today. A uh, few housekeeping items. One of the things we did today, we had a very incredible, productive week, members of the corporate roundtable, so thank all the members who are here. Uh, we elected our new executive committee, and so we do have a small order of business. We're going to ask the new officers to come forward, ask President Mitchell to come forward. Real briefly, we're going to uh, conduct a little bit of business, and uh, we'll be um, swearing these officers in. If you would please give us a little bit more of your time. These people are working really hard to bring their resources in order to make sure NBCSL has what it needs. Uh, but we would love for you to participate in that process. So, President Mitchell, we'll get the uh, new executive officers here before the body, and uh, we will conduct that business real, real quickly. We're working for a floating mic. Uh, if we don't have one, we will um, ask the president to come to the podium and proceed accordingly. The staff says there is no mic. So, President Mitchell, uh, the microphone is yours. You guys come on up. Come on up. Let everybody see you. Let's give them a round of applause. <clears throat> sure. Sure, absolutely. Okay. We're going to do this quick. We'll do this quick. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, if we could have your attention, please, so that they can quickly execute this oath and be the new officers of the National Black Caucus of State Legislators Corporate Round Table, starting uh, with our chair elect and going through. I want you to repeat. Actually, we're going to do this in unison. You would repeat after me. I. State your name. Kristen Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will discharge. That I will discharge. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. The duties and responsibilities. The duties and responsibilities of the office to which I have been elected to serve. Of the office to which I have been elected to serve. I do solemnly swear. To abide, by to abide by and uphold, and uphold the, bylaws of this organization the bylaws of this organization to, form, to perform my duties to, perform my duties to, the, best of my ability, to the best of my ability and capacities, and capacities without, fear or favor, without fear or favor, but with the aim in view, but with the aim in view of fur furthering the purpose of this organization 
and advancing the interest of the community, and advancing the interest of the community to, which it is dedicated, to which it is dedicated, and to conduct myself in a manner, and to conduct myself in a manner befitting a good and true member. Befitting a good and true member. Congratulations, new officers. Please give them a hand. Madam Chair, why don't you say a few words? Thank you. So thank you again to the Executive Committee for standing up and wanting to serve with me over the next couple of years. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity. For you CRT members out in the audience, please know that I'm a resource to you and certainly to our members of NBCSL. I look forward to working more closely with you as well. Have a great afternoon. Thank you all to all the new officers. Thank you. Next, next housekeeping item, we have a person, every year we have a CRT member of the year. And it's often overlooked, but every year you have someone that kind of goes above and beyond the call of duty. I'm pleased to say that this person continues to exemplify what we need as CRT leaders in order to bring the resources to this organization. Uh, and this person is someone who worked to organize our committee structure. We really believe that our committees have to work collaboratively with the NBCSL committees, and so we've worked hard to get our committee staffed so that all of our committees has a relationship manager that can reach out to the legislative bodies so we can focus on the public policy that you all are setting as your priorities, but also provide you the resources you need in order to set those public policy agendas. So uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Perry Daniel with Stride, would you please come forward? So Perry, on behalf of the Corporate Roundtable, we want to thank you for all that you've done this year. We appreciate your hard work and sacrifice in advocating for high quality education, but also being a true champion for NBCSL. Congratulations, Perry. Thank you very much. I don't have much to say. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to work with uh, Patrick and your administration and NBCSL. NBCSL. Uh, it's been a great opportunity. Look forward to continuing supporting NBCSL and the Corporate Roundtable. Thank you. Would all CRT members come forward real quickly? All CRT members, real quickly. Quickly. Come on. We have something for you. You know, one of the things we talk about is the investment that these companies make, and everyone spreads out throughout the conference, and you've got your lapel pins on and your badges, but we really don't get a chance to know each other, right? You really have to have a relationship, and so this is an opportunity for our legislators to see the Corporate Roundtable members. Uh, we've grown the Corporate Roundtable during a pandemic from 70 companies to 135 companies. So, so let's... We really, we really appreciate that. I don't know if they all will fit, but we will try. That was what he just said. So um, we want to thank all of our CRT members. We usually have a mic so we can allow them to introduce themselves and what companies they represent. Uh, we don't have a mic. If we can get a lav that floats, if staff can get that, that would be great too. But we want to thank the Corporate Roundtable members and let them introduce themselves so that our legislators know who are the members of the Corporate Roundtable uh, based on their work. We have pins for all the CRT members, and so we want to make sure you all know who these people are and how much we appreciate them. Is there a floating love that we can pass around? All right, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. All right, let's start, let's start right here. Let's start right here and pass the mic. Please introduce yourself and what company you represent. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is, can you guys hear me? Hello everyone, my name is Ashaki Lloyd. I represent Horizon Therapeutics. We are based in Deerfield, Illinois. That's our US headquarters. We are a biopharmaceutical company that specializes in medicines that treat rare diseases, autoimmune conditions, and severe inflammatory conditions as well. We are honored to be a Corporate Roundtable member. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shamir Greenaway, and I'm representing Amerahealth Caritas. 
My Health Caritas is a managed care organization headquartered in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hello, I'm Lakeitha Anderson. I work for Brownstein, Hyatt, Farmer, and Shrek, and I am your new cherry elect. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Gibbons, and I represent Amscott Corporation, Tampa, Florida. She's already I'm Steve Hightower, Hightower Petroleum and Hightower EV Solutions, uh, Middletown, Ohio. Good afternoon. My name is Nate Miles with Eli Lilly Pharmaceuticals, makers of fine medications uh, and uh, better living through chemistry. <laughs> I can't follow that. Hello, everyone. My name is Jay Scheinman. I represent Square and Cash App. Good afternoon. My name is Tammy Brown Alvarado, and I represent Merck. Good afternoon. Chelsea Bennett represents Square, Cash App, and Title. Good afternoon. I'm the Honorable Angela Williams, and I am the Senior Director of External Affairs for Stride Learning. Hello again. I'm Kristen Givens with State Farm, your new chair of the Sierra team. Garth Alston, Senior Director, State Government Affairs for Altria. Hey, everybody. Nayoka McCoy, Chief Academic Officer for Stride. Good afternoon. Judy Jenkins, Director of State Government Affairs for Johnson & Johnson. Good afternoon. Darren Reed, Senior Vice President, Stride. Hello, I'm Joe Armstrong, and I represent Christian Healthcare Ministries. Daniel with Stride Learning. Yolanda Cash Jackson with Becker and co founder of the National Black Professional Lobbyists Ooh. Association. Yeah! Hey, yo, Cash. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Johnny Tillett with McGuire Woods Consulting, a lobbyist, and I represent several other clients. I'm going to just throw two of them out there so I won't get fired uh, Maximus, Smile Direct Club, LKQ. Bill Cheeks, and I'm here representing Experian, the credit reporting agency. Get your Experian Boost report. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Chanel Jackson, former state lawmaker from the great state of Michigan, uh, senior Director of Government Affairs, or State Government Affairs for OpFi. We're a Chicago-based financial tech firm. Two, two, more, two, more, two more, two more. Come on, come on, come on. Up. Thank you. Yes, on. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Harry Anastopoulos from CTIA, Director of External Affairs. Um, yeah, is that it? <laughs> I'm sh can you hear me? Good afternoon, Charmaine Anthony. I'm a medical science liaison and I'm representing Novartis Pharmaceuticals. Our headquarter in the U.S. is based in East Hanover, New Jersey. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Director of Government Affairs for Altria Group, John Mason. Good afternoon, Don Patillo Exum, Merck. Good afternoon, Nicholas Worrell, NTSB. Good afternoon, Terry Lee, Merck Pharmaceuticals, and so honored to have been a former chair of the Corporate Roundtable. Here, here. Yeah. <laughs> Melissa Bishop Murphy, Senior Director of Government Relations and Multicultural Affairs, Pfizer, and former chair of the CRT as well. Shauna Williams, Senior Manager of Government Relations, Reynolds. Thank you. Alan Owens, uh, representing Waste Management, headquartered in Houston, Texas. Hi, everyone. My name is Mary DeRome. I'm the Director of Medical Communication and Education at the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. We um, have worked with about 70 of you in the audience to film public service announcements to bring awareness to multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer that disproportionately affects the black community. We're located in Connecticut. Great to be here. Hi, everyone. Asha Calabrese, Director of Alliance Management, also with the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. Get your cancer screenings. Cleo Washington, AT&T. 
Courtney Crowder, Managing Director of APCO Worldwide, a global public affairs and communications consultancy. Will somebody please just say Courtney? Appreciate you. <laughs> Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. Good afternoon, everybody. Tiger Wells, Director of State Government Affairs for Duke Energy in South Carolina. Good to be with you. All right. Let's give all of our CRT members a round of applause. Thank you so much, you all. Thank you so much. Please take your seats and thank you so much. Last housekeeping item, would all the former chairs, if you're a former chair, stay up here. If you are a former CRT chair, don't leave. But as you can see, legislators, there's a lot of companies that are here to support you. They have a lot of information that can be supportive in your districts. And so we wanted you to see the CRT members that make this possible. And I want to thank all of them for their investment in NBCSL. It just supports us to do the work that you all need us to do. So thank you. Thank you so much. Former chairs, former chairs, former chairs. You know, everyone knows what it takes to be a chair until you become a chair. And as Brother Chavis said, you know, this is the Ben Ruffin Corporate Roundtable Luncheon. Uh, ben uh, was a mentor to me. And a little fun fact, I, I live in Durham. And so this sort of was full circle for me to be chairman of the Corporate Roundtable, standing on Ben Ruffin's shoulders. And so we thank Ben, we recognize him, and he's a noob. So as the parry just threw the yo, I want to make sure we recognize that. So, uh, but these, these people right here are the ones that got me into this 10 years ago. Kevin Booker said to me when I first came, he said, you're going to be chair one day. I said, I'm not here for that. I don't want to be chair. I just want to serve and be a part of the experience of supporting our legislators. But each of these people mentored me. We worked hard to keep them engaged. And so Terry, Melissa mentored me, Calvin and Cleo. These are our former chairs. And so I want to let them know how much I appreciate them, their mentorship, and their confidence in me in order to become chairman of the Corporate Roundtable. Let's give our former chairs a round of applause. And their, their pen has a different color, so I'm looking forward to putting mine on as soon as I step off the stage. So, all right, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you, members, for your time and attention. We appreciate you. Uh, this will conclude our luncheon. I hope you have a very productive day. We look forward to seeing you at the gala tonight and the additional policy sessions. But we couldn't do this without you, and we're here to support you in every way we can. Thank you. God bless you.